Hello, I'm Ajahn Jyoti Palo. Welcome to Sauntering into Silence. I was quite surprised that the video I made on the near-death experience got so many views. But at another level, I was not surprised because right after that experience, I would uh, actually tell the story to just about anybody who would listen to me. I found that in the telling of the story, people would have questions and they'd, they'd ask me things that I'd never thought about and it gave me a lot of clarity about the events. And most of these conversations happened within a few months after the experience, so the, it was still kind of fresh in my mind. I was actually very surprised that like so many people wanted to hear stories about near death or uh, people are just intrigued by death. And it's just something that we don't talk about in our culture. So I'm not surprised at all, actually, at one level, of how many people viewed the, the video. I mentioned that I could uh, go on with the story for about an hour, and it's true. So I thought I'd tell at least two more parts to it. So in this video, maybe I'll talk about the leading up to that event. Starting about three days before the near-death experience, we had made it up, my, me and my friends, to Namche Bazaar. And we decided, as a kind of a day of acclimating to the altitude, we hiked up to, I think it's a town called Tame, which is where the Sherpa Tenzing Norgay, who was one of the first people to summit Mount Everest with uh, Sir uh, Hillary. So we hiked up there that day and we, we spent the night there. I had been kind of sick the whole time, just really no appetite and continuing to hike. And I, as I mentioned, whenever I would eat in the evening, I'd have these really high fevers and uh, which would cause these uh, sometimes hallucinations and just really, really weird experiences. But So we hiked up to this this village and the same thing happened. And But I woke up the next morning and I, I knew I was uh, something that had changed and I was much worse. And I don't want to be critical of my friends because they really didn't know how severely ill I was. But uh, I asked them, they, they really wanted to leave and go down to Namche to get start trekking towards Mount Everest. And so I was like, well, if, you, if you're going to do that, find me a porter. And I went and laid down on this, this bench in this uh, guest house. I woke up, my backpack was the only one there, and I was going to, oh no. I ended up having to walk about 20 or 30 feet, uh, 20 or 30 paces, and my heart would just start beating so, so strongly that I thought I was going to have like a heart attack. So I'd stop and, and, and rest and let my heartbeat return to normal. And then I'd walk about 30 paces and then the same thing all over again. So it should have been probably a two hour hike or something, end up taking the entire day. Finally, I kept asking people all along the way if they would, if I could hire them to be my porter to carry my backpack, which didn't have too much in it. But uh, it was kind of harvest season, so there, there was really no one to help. And I finally got uh, someone to do it for me. I could tell he was getting really frustrated because I think he was thinking it was going to be like a half hour job for him, but it ended up being a couple hours and yeah, just getting really upset with me and frustrated. And I kept telling him, and I spoke a little um, Nepali at the time, and I kept telling him, when I can see Namche Bazaar, you know, I'll take the pack because I knew from there it was hiking downhill. So I told him this and, you know, he finally agreed. And then I could see him further up the trail and he was all happy, and so I figured, okay, Namche must be there. And so I tried to, I forget which arm it was, I think maybe my left arm, I tried to raise it, and it was completely numb, and I couldn't, couldn't move my arm. I tried yelling to him, and the whole side of my face was numb, and I realized I was having a stroke. And so he must have recognized it as well, because he came running down to me and kind of you know, got under my arm and, and walked me up to the, to the ridge there. I remember I'd said, you know, okay, I can see Namche, so go, go. He wouldn't, he wouldn't leave my side. So that, okay, you know, starting to think, okay, this is serious. We started hiking down and there was a, a monastery, a gampa, right in the middle of the trail. I wasn't religious at this point in my life, but I knew that they had this tradition that you always keep um, religious objects on to your right side. And as we were coming down the trail, there was this monastery, and the monastery was on the left. And I saw that there was this little trail that goes around the back side of the monastery, and it actually went uphill. I insisted with Sherpa there that, uh, that we go to the left. And I could tell he was perplexed or frustrated. Just as we started, this, this train of yaks came around. It was like 100 yaks. It just took forever for them to pass. But I insisted we wait. 
and then we walked around keeping the monastery on my right side. As soon as we got around the monastery, I saw my first Westerner of the day, and I yelled down to him, and when he came up to, to see what was the matter, turns out he was a medical student, and he rec you know, I think he was from Ireland, Ireland or Scotland, but he immediately recognized what was happening to me, and so he took the pack, and we paid the Sherpa, and we started going down, and the very first guest house we got to, we stopped, I was standing outside, and I heard him go in and ask if they had a room. And I heard the woman you know, reply, yes, they did. And so I walked in, and she looked at me, and she said, but not for him. And that's when I realized I must be looking like I was really close to death because, uh, you know, I can just imagine, like, the worst thing that could happen to be someone die in your house, you know, Westerner and just all the hassles. And so she wouldn't let me in. We came around a corner, and I recognized the guest house that I had stayed in the night before and where all of the rest of my packing, my hiking gear was. And so we went, and she was legitimately closed. I think her name was Lac La Doma. Her, her place was closed because the next night her husband was coming back with a, a trekking party, paid clients. And so, but I remember, it's like, uh, I just forced my way past her, just sort of pushed my way. And, and the whole time I was like walking through the, the corridor, she's like, no, 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 no. And I uh, got into this dormitory where there's all these beds, and just the first bed that I came to, I just crashed. And she's like, okay. Like, you're here, <laughs> and uh, the the medical student, I think his name was David, um, said he was going to go find the local doctor, and he did, and came back, and they diagnosed me as having altitude sickness, and uh, he gave me some medication and said he'd check with me in the morning. So I slept a little bit, and then really beautiful experience. I, w I went into the kitchen after I kind of woke up, and Lacladome was in there preparing the meal for the next day. And say so I'd been studying Nepali for a bit, and uh, uh, it seems like every word that I memorized just came back to me. I just remembered it. I'm sitting there, we're having this conversation, and and just you know just feeling very comfortable. You know, still sick and stuff like that, but just feeling really safe being in her kitchen and talking with her. Well, it was about two years later. I was hiking in the, in uh, New Hampshire. And it dawned on me that uh, we had had, when all my friends were with her, we, we had a couple of conversations with her in, in Nepali, and we realized she didn't speak Nepali. <laughs> we had all these miscommunications. So it was two years later I had this realization. She was probably like this brilliant psychiatrist, and she had, you know, like I was probably just gibbering, or I was, you know, maybe making sense and or using Nepali correctly, but. You know, I was just like, you know, saying something like, you know, so, you know, you know, how big is your family? And, you know, and I would imagine she was responding back, you know, like, oh, I have three kids and my husband's the Sherpa trekking guide. And you know, what does your family do? And then I'd start telling her and, and we had this back and forth for like a half hour. And I realized later I was, I was probably just sitting there talking gibberish or she didn't understand a word of what I was saying. But she was just to keep me calm, just just talking and making it sound like it was conversational so who knows but it was it's quite a fun memory to a couple of years later realize what that conversation didn't actually happen <laughs> but uh, the next morning I woke up and and uh, say David came back and I told him you know I really needed to get down to lower altitude and so he he and the Lacladoma found this woman who was in the previous video the photograph um, found her to, to be my my porter so that next day hiking down was probably one of the funnest days of my life. Just that, that woman was just very fun and playful. And, and she also, when she was going down to these, these other sort of settlements and little villages, she knew everybody there. So she'd stop in and, and, ha and have a drink or have some tea and just socializing on the way down. So it was this real fun day. And I remember one time um, we went into this, this guest house and there was a lot of you know people um, Nepali people there it was totally off the, the tourist beat. It was just the locals. And and it was so fun just sitting there not speaking the language and just watching people's, you know, mannerisms and speech. I could tell at one point there was this this uh, conversation was happening and they were making fun of, they were setting this guy up for a joke. And somehow just by just watching body language, I knew that this was a joke and that who was going to be the brunt of the joke. And sure enough, as soon as the, the person realized he was be being made fun of, he, you know, 
pretended like he was angry and you know stomped his feet and stuff but it's like it was so amazing that i actually saw it happening before you know like probably anybody else knew it was going to happen so there's all these experiences like that so I, I really value that whole experience of what happened but then so we ended up getting down to there's a, a point where you have to have a trekking permit to go into saga martha uh, mount everest uh, park and so we we actually got past that place and then and stayed the night there and then that's when i had the the really kind of bizarre experience of little people coming and visiting me so that's a long set up for that part. So that's the second part. There's probably a third part coming about kind of how all of this experience uh, changed the way I viewed the world. Okay, thanks for watching.